Was he going to be able to be at this one? Damien, do you remember, or is Robert planning on being able to attend this, or was there some something that took him away? I don't remember anything, Tom. Um, I know he was out all during Christmas break. I haven't been able He's to get on. a hold of him. So He's okay. on. Okay, great. Hello, Robert. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay. Um, it is 930 and we are going to start um, the January 3rd, uh, 2023. Happy New Year's uh, OEB Strategies on Evidence and Outcomes Work Group. Uh, and I'll call the meeting to order. Um, and our first, the agenda uh, Rose has on the um, uh, on the computer screen, we're going to, after we do our usual business of approving November's synopsis, we're going to ask our carriers to tell us about the uh, uh, things that they're looking at adding to the 23-24 plan year. So this is a, a significant, um, this is an informational session and it's time for CIAO to understand the implications of what's being asked or looked at for adding and for us to ask questions. And uh, if there are additional types of information that we think the board will need, it gives us time uh, over the next three to four months as we plan the renewal. So that's the reason what we're, what we're going to be looking at and doing today. Um, Glenn is not here this week, but uh, Margaret is uh, filling in for um, for him, I think. Right, Margaret? That's right. Good morning and okay. Happy New Year. Great. Thank you very much. So, and, uh, and we'll, Tom, oh, yes. Tom, just to chime in a note, so you, um, so you're aware, because I don't know if you can see um the entire list of participants on the meeting, but I did want to note there are a couple of members of the PEB board who have dialed in, I think, to listen in today as well. So, um, both um Andrea Fultz and Kimberly Hendricks from the PEB board are Wonderful. also on. Welcome, welcome you to you know the the ongoing collaboration is uh, between OEB and PEB is one necessary and too appreciated. Um, okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and start. And uh, the first order of business is the, um, is the synopsis from November. Uh, is there any questions or additions that people would like to make? I will point out that uh, I think we had two actions. One was the uh, addition of the diabetes measure as part of the dental um, uh, presentation. Um, and I think it's screening, uh, screening, or, oral screening for diabetics, and that will be put both in the OEB and PEB work plans. Uh, and then the second one had to do with uh, at the next report asking both Kaiser Permanente and Willamette Dental to share uh, the. Um, uh, demographics, um, um, some of the outcome and utilization data by demographics, specifically looking for health disparities. So uh, any other questions um, before we go for approval? If not, I'll accept a motion. So moved. And Seconded. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. So we're now on to the second agenda item, and we are going to be having Kaiser Permanente uh, present to us. Um, and uh, we're going to be hearing about uh, new uh, changes to that uh, delivery system. Uh, and so we have both Dr. Keith Bachman and Kari Sturdivant um, to give our presentation. Is that correct, you two? That, that is correct. Good morning. All righty. All right. Happy, a welcome and happy 2023 for 
uh, all the uh, OEB and uh, PEB teams. So Sapari and I are happy to be here today to kind of go through what we're excited about at Kaiser Permanente uh, in 2023, moving into 2024. Uh, and we kind of have some programs to talk about and initiatives and things that are dear to our heart and we think are going to be effective in taking better care of OEB and PEB members and taking care of all our members. Uh, next slide, please. And Keith, just to be specific, um, I know that um, um, when Glenn outreached to the carriers, um, it was what specifically is happening for the OEB population. And my understanding was what uh, uh, KEP's response was, this is what the presentation today is going to be something that we are doing across all the program. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. So these, here's what we were asked to speak on today. Uh, uh, letters A through H, uh, which are kind of, uh, we will go through with this as much detail as we can. Um, we'll be kind of bucketing things into care delivery innovations, our virtual care program, health equity, which is near and dear to our heart, and certainly in our overall Kaiser Permanente operating plan as a major uh, tenant, uh, and then finally talking about importance of uh, mental and behavioral health and changes in that going forward. Um, next uh, slide, please. This is just a reminder, you know, that we are we are different and we are set up under one roof with all the different parts of the healthcare system uh, and a healthcare financing system all under one roof working together. And, and this is this is unique uh, in the industry. This is how Kaiser Permanente is built. We are in the community. We are part of many communities around uh, the United States, uh, but not every community. But again, it's on the ground, it's people, it's our, from our IT staff to our environmental services staff, to our clinicians, to our physicians, to our um, uh, insurance executives and insurance uh, 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 managers uh, that all work together, providing the best member experience to our our members. And we really work across all lines of business from Medicaid to Medicare, to commercial insurance, to ACA insurance. And really we try to optimize for all of those. And we tend to do things just like Tom was kind of alluding to that are really in the best interest of our whole population. Our financing is different. We are a land for our, our really primary, more than 90% of our financing is in land 4B, which is a comprehensive population-based payment. Uh, that's It's capitated uh, for the, um, the medical providers, for the medical group, um, which changes a lot of the incentives. So things are not done on a fee-for-service basis. They're really done uh, with an eye towards efficiency and value-based care. And that's how we're designed. That's how we've always been before there was such a thing as a land model before there was such a terminology as value-based care. That's how Kaiser Permanente uh, has always operated as a beacon of difference uh, in a big uh, healthcare landscape. Um, uh, next slide, please. And uh, we'll be talking about some of the things that are uh, in care delivery. So one thing with urgency care, which really yeah, everybody knows all the healthcare systems in the community and in the country have been pretty frayed and pretty exhausted uh, related to uh, issues around COVID, issues related to staffing, uh, issues related to the lack of care or delayed care that people had, which led to an increased acuity uh, and care challenges and somewhat uh, less preventive care going on during the midst of COVID. So one sort of canary in the coal mine was our urgency care program, uh, which really uh, was was significantly struggling. But we got together. Um, we looked at the data. We looked at our. We talked to our clinicians. We talked to our nurses. We talked to our urgency care staff, and we decided how can we make some changes with this. So we really worked, changed the workflow um, by decreasing the time for when someone walks in the door to they can see a clinician. That way tests can get ordered. Uh, people can be stratified in terms of risk uh, and things that are even more complicated uh, can get started earlier. So we've been able to reduce uh, appointment time by over 20% uh, and each urgency care is seeing more than 17 additional uh, appointments per day. Um, the overall urgency care volume has increased during this time. So we're seeing we're able to get more patients through uh, with less time uh, due to 
uh, a urgency care redesign model. It may not be quite so obvious if you're not a frequent visitor to urgency care, but the work is going on in the back end uh, to get people through faster, be more rational in how we're doing that, uh, and deploy our resources most efficiently. Um, next slide, please. Turning to the hospital <coughs> and sepsis. Um, sepsis is the leading cause. This is the next slide. Thank you. Sepsis is the leading cause of hospital deaths. <clears throat> and we are we have really focused on that. And now our two Kaiser hospitals in the Northwest region are among the highest scores in terms of sepsis care in the nation. Um, we, these scores are about 30 30 percent higher or 30 points higher than national average uh, and uh, results in better outcomes, which is less deaths, less, less ICU stays, which of course, and less hospital days, which of course relates, uh, does lead to lower cost. Uh, sepsis is essentially bloodstream infections, uh, and we have our data systems organized to detect those earlier as somebody is uh, developing these parameters, either on presentation in the emergency room or during their hospital stay. Uh, a team is activated, uh, algorithms are started, treatment is given, pharmacists, nurses, and physicians are working together. I will note with all these care delivery innovations, one theme throughout them all is teamwork. And in our model, with all the parts working together, we're able to use teamwork to provide better outcomes. Our hospitals are safe. Uh, both our hospitals are leapfrog A, which leads to less hospital acquired infections, which also leads to lower rate of sepsis. So again, this is a team effort using data, using our systems able to look for sepsis on presentation. Uh, if the kind of the electronic, if the uh, vital signs um, are changing in a negative direction towards sepsis, that will provide send some alerts out, which gets the teams activated to more rapidly identify sepsis uh, and get people treated. Um, next slide, please. KP at home is our hospital at home program is really the other, it, Groups are starting these, but this is really the most robust program in our service area. This is a hospital level care for most, for many conditions in the right circumstances done at home. We've had, as of 2022, we had over 915 patients in the program. Uh, and when we did some pretty careful outcome studies, we actually saw higher patient satisfaction and higher, higher communications with the care team and higher, um, perceptions about the complexity of the transition home. Uh, readmission rates are quite low, uh, over 50% lower than in routine hospital care. This again requires a great deal of coordination uh, with staff, including paramedics, infusion specialists, nurses, pharmacists, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, uh, physicians available 24 hours a day through a video link uh, as our nurses, uh, home PT, OT, home imaging, phlebotomy, uh, and even home meals. So this is a way of dealing with um, fairly common uh, hospitalization kinds of things like uh, emphysema exacerbations, uh, bad asthma attacks, common infections, COVID obviously, all leading to um, ab ability to open up beds in the hospital. And you know, in Oregon, we have a hospital bed shortage. So by bringing you having six to 22 patients at a time taken care of at home, that does open up extra beds for our members. And what we're seeing, one thing we're seeing in the last couple of years is up to 30% of our hospital filled with non-Kaiser members uh, due to uh, overall bed shortages in the state. Um, we will actually go and develop a communication setup, bring Wi-Fi in to a member's home if they don't have uh, adequate Wi-Fi already. So all this, the technology is there, uh, patients like it, provides great outcomes. Uh, low risk, very low risk of complication uh, and readmissions uh, when this program is used. Next pair, next slide, please. And one final program we're working on uh, with our highest risk members is those transitions of care, people going from hospital to sniff care and sniff care to home. We know that's just a very complex, potentially risky, um, labor intensive uh, time, but the time spent in deploying nursing resources, pharmacy resources, uh, and physician resources to help with those transitions uh, has been quite effective at lowering readmission rates, uh, decreasing the number of days in the hospital, and decreasing the number of the days in skilled nursing facilities uh, with great outcomes. One of the complexities of COVID has been the difficulty discharging from the hospital uh, with many nursing, uh, residential nursing facilities and skilled nursing facilities not taking patients due to COVID or to staffing issues. 
I will turn over the next slide uh, to Sapari to talk about some of our virtual health solutions. Um, Keith, uh, Keith yeah. on that last one, um, the I think it's been nationally identified, but also in Oregon specifically, that the lack of SNS, SNF uh, uh, capacity has resulted in prolonged length of stay and uh, um, uh, again, bogging up the whole system. Is that what you're, is, uh, I assume that's what this is to address and how successful do you think you are with it? Well, there's still, there's still, there's still the roadblock of inability to discharge because of SNFs and ICF. Sometimes they'll go on divert or they won't be able to accept more emissions because of staffing or because of COVID outbreaks. So it, it can happen either way. The other thing is dialysis beds too has been. So now we have a handful of patients at any given time. We never had this before essentially on in our acute hospitals on nursing status, not being not needing physicians every day, just waiting for placement. So that's been a problem. But this is also to help empty beds at the SNFs, get people out of SNFs right. when they can, right. opening up beds at that. So okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. On to Sapari. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. And good morning. And just wanted to wish you and your families a happy new year and looking forward to um, connecting with you in 2023. So I get to, um, the uh, luxury of talking about our virtual health solutions. I'm very excited about this. So if you can move to the new slide or next slide. Thanks, Rose. Okay. So our first um, virtual uh, health uh, solutions that we are rolling out is our maternity at home program. And actually, you know, this was piloted last year and we had approximately 170 members enrolled in the program. And now we are opening up this new care option to all of our members with prenatal and postpartum care. Um, how this will work is that during your office visit um, early in the pregnancy, our clinician will have a discussion with you to talk about your needs and preferences. And then it's a joint decision by the member and the clinician as to whether or not video visits um, will continue or will be desirable for the individual. So if this is the case, the nurse will reach out um, to the member and kind of talk through the toolkit that's available and also to talk about, you know, when to call for concerns. So the toolkit includes, as you can see, a fetal Doppler, which will measure or detect the baby's heart rate, a blood pressure monitor, and a weight scale. And the monitor and the weight scale are actually Bluetooth enabled and can pair with a smartphone app and can send the readings directly to the member's electronic health record. So members who choose this option um, are still seen in person at regular intervals, of course, for their lab work, for their vaccinations, ultrasounds, so on and so forth. And they can request to change a video visit to become an in-person visit at any time. And, you know, and as I was thinking through or, or, or looking into this um, virtual solution, I was thinking that, you know, as a new mom, as a new mom, when I was a new mom many, many, many years ago, I think I really would have appreciated this option. It really would help to balance out, of course, you know, all the things that happen in life and, of course, the work, um, work case scenario. Okay, next slide. So optimized visits. Um, this was launched in Q2 of 2022 and it allows members to see their personalized care reminders and to maximize the time that they are in the clinic. So our KP mobile app members who have provided a notification and location permission to us are welcome to an outpatient medical building via a push notification. So in this example here, you can see that um, this member is in our Cascade Park Clinic. And so when they select the get more done at your visit box, they can see the care gaps um, that they have outstanding and they can choose to close those visits during the office appointment. And in addition to that, pick up pres any prescriptions when it's ready to be picked up. Any questions here? Perfect, next slide. Um, another feature to support our members post appointment task is our after visit summary notification. Um, it can be overwhelming if there's a list of tasks for you to complete or follow up on after a doctor's visit. 
So an after visit summary um, outlining all of these tasks is currently available in our kp.org account. However, to support findability and to prompt actions such as medication fills or referrals or preventive labs and imaging, an after visit summary banner will actually appear on your kp.org app five days post appointment um, to your on your kp.org. And so this may be just a small action that we're doing. However, we will continue to look for ways to support our members in their health journey. And again, trying to make it as efficient as possible when they're in our clinic. Next slide. Have yeah, I mean, so you already heard one example of remote patient, remote patient monitoring uh, for maternity, and this is just for additional programs that are utilizing remote patient monitoring. I know it seems a little funny because it's like many people have been using, you know, Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuffs or smartwatches that automatically download heart rates and things like that for a while now. So it seems like, well, why is it so hard for healthcare to get on the bandwagon? And I would just say it is logistically complicated because there's all this data coming in. We need to have the infrastructure to both find the data that is meaningful uh, and then have the teams of clinicians sort of organized uh, to respond uh, to that. So these are all high risk conditions, congestive heart failure, high risk OB, diabetes uh, that we are using for remote patient monitoring. All those programs are expanding. Our virtual cardiac rehabilitation program is pretty unique uh, in our service area and has some really great outcomes. Cardiac rehab is something that somebody gets after an episode of congestive heart failure or after a heart attack or heart surgery. And by doing it virtually, people are really don't have the driving to a therapy facility and they really can be monitored. One of our cardiologists who works with the program was just saying how great one of her patients did, who she saw back in follow-up, who had lost a bunch of weight and lowered his blood pressure in his, uh, to the point where she needed to actually reduce uh, his, and stop some of his blood pressure medications. Uh, and this was somebody she didn't expect was going to do uh, that great with the lifestyle program. So again, so that's these are four of our remote patient monitoring programs uh, that are all be are are live, have been tested, and are being expanded in 2023. So as you say, these are ones that th this is a, a research project. These uh, all have been shown in other situations to be cost effective and and uh, improve satisfaction yep. uh, and and what you're doing is trying to make it move it from research into a routine practice. Yeah, and we and luckily we can we can leverage models going on other Kaiser regions and pretty quickly adopt those when they've been shown to be successful. And similarly, we do something first that gets adopted elsewhere. Yeah. So these are all things that are going to be increasing increasingly used uh, through in the future. Okay. And are and, currently ongoing. Um, and uh, last question, how um, the fact that you are um, uh, a capitated program global budget, um, not tied to fee for service, how important is it, do you think that that um, funding leads to being able to do this? Because what I'm wondering is, how do you move these types of programs into uh, a, a fee-for-service based well, I, world? I, I would imagine most of these are pretty sound in principle. And if there was enough volume, a startup somewhere could develop a point solution to do any of those. But the difference would be, it wouldn't be part of someone's general healthcare system. You would have two different or three different apps on your phone to go to for your blood pressure issue, for your diabetes issue, and for your behavioral health issue, as opposed to for all of these, it's all gonna be done through one, one app called KP Ally, which then feeds into the medical record into kp.org. So that would be a difference. I don't think there's anything unique. It's not cutting edge in the technology. I think technology is out there, but it's how do we apply it, have a good customer experience, and integrate that with the rest of their care. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Keith. Perfect. And next slide. Thanks, Rose. So just wanted to talk about our e-visit modules. Um, we, we have this in place today. Um, our current modules that are available addresses um, coughs and colds, um, allergies, women's health, dermatology, eye and ear pain. Um, just a quick example um, of this 
using this module. Um, my daughter actually had an eye pain that actually just happened yesterday. And she came to me and said, you know, I have, and I have to tell you this story because, I mean, she's my daughter. She um, she should know more. I should have explained to her more. But her first reaction was to go to urgent care. Um, and so I suggested using an e-visit module um, because she's had this issue in the past. And I think fortunately, you know, in going through this algorithm, it kind of got her to the place where, you know, and she also had to, to send in a photo of her eye um, of just that quick turnaround without having, you know, to leave the house to go to urgent care and to um, go through this module to get to where she was able to get a prescription from our physician. And because she's had this issue before, you know, it's in her health record. So it was a bit more um, more easy, more common for our, our clinicians to kind of prescribe and, and look at what she had. So, and next slide, um, just wanted to share um, some of the newer, um, uh, modules that are coming on board. So in October, we rolled out um, a COVID treatment um, oxavoid, um, module for our members. And in November, because it's cold and flu season, um, we develop an influenza questionnaire. And then we also reintroduce our tobacco cessation program. And in 2023, so coming this quarter, Q1 um, of 2023, we are building an anxiety depression screening e-visit module and also a physical therapy module. And next slide, just wanted to share some stats with you. Um, so the graph is really a snapshot of the breakout of our utilization between males and females. As you can see, about 76% of our e-visit utilizers are female and 24% are male. Um, in addition, we have a live, it, it went live in December, um, an e-visit chat with a, an actual physician. So during your e-visit, um, if you needed to chat with a clinician, um, and that option is readily available for you. Um, our e-visit demand in November, obviously, it was, it was really high, and it was high, obviously, due to the upper respiratory infection that people were getting. Um, and our e-visit modules are being highly utilized. So um, as of December, um, we had over 92,000 e-visits uh, as compared to, you know, the 73,000 in 2021. And we're projecting that this will continue to increase in the future. Jeff, you have a question? Yeah, could you go back a slide, please? So, uh, Sapari, are you able to elaborate at all on the um, anxiety, depression, um, e-visit that's coming? Do you have anything more? On yeah, that? I, I can. I can talk about that. I mean, so it's. I did it. I was just curious. We actually had it. It was. It was up and running for a while in twenty. 21 and then when there was a need to had to deploy more resources towards Paxlovid and COVID it got pulled but it was pretty successful and it's a it's a it's a series of questions about depression anxiety substance use that you would expect that can uh lead to a prescription can lead to a recommendation for um uh, other behavioral health programs or referral to mental health. It is reviewed. There are screens related to suicidality and other severe questions in there. And I will say, I thought it did a pretty nice job. It asked me some questions about trauma, PTSD, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive behaviors that I'm not sure I ask when I'm talking to my patients about depression and anxiety on a reliable basis. And also screen for bipolar and family uh, mental health problems, which can have a bearing on treatment. So, I mean, it's not going to be solve a problem, but it's going to move you with the appropriate next steps, which might include a prescription if it's straightforward, might include a visit with a PCP or a psychiatrist, uh, might include referral to emergency psychiatric services or recommendation to go to the emergency room if needed. So it, it is all these are reviewed by a, a physician, you know, very quickly after the uh, questionnaires provided. Um, and this is keeps the the flow of resources available to the member. Did that answer your question, Jeff? It does. I just want to add in my sphere of acquaintances, uh, counselors, uh, even though things have opened up, are doing at least 50% of their practice online. Their um, clients seem to really like yeah. that. And so um, I'm hoping that that has um, helped with the access issues that we've experienced in the past. 
I would say this e-visit program is more screening assessment in a first step as opposed to uh, a conjunctivitis or a rash, which might be one and done. Yeah. And Robert, you're next up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Keith and Safari, uh, can you uh, explain the difference between an e-visit module and a virtual visit from the from the user end? Sure. A, a virtual visit, um, it will be a video, usually a video visit, sometimes a phone visit, which you would schedule for anything, whether it's a follow-up, whether it's a new problem, and that's still available. We'll be talking about Get Care Now, which is our new video urgency care program. Uh, and so it's pretty open-ended. You start from anywhere. An e-visit is a little bit more structured, so you would start with a chief complaint or chief concern. My eye hurts, uh, I have a rash, uh, I need birth control, um, I'm having allergies, I'm having trouble with anxiety or sleep, right? And then it would ask you a series of questions to kind of go further. So if you have, if you're there for cough, I might would say, are you short of breath? Do you have a fever? Or have you been exposed to COVID? And it goes through a structured set of questions or a tree based on what you've done. You're clicking online to do that. It's gathering the data. And then it gets to the end, at which point a, a physician would review it, uh, agree with the diagnosis, the proposed diagnosis, authorize any prescriptions that are needed or referrals that are needed. Um, or if, if it fell out and it really wasn't, it clearly didn't make any sense, would contact you by chat or phone to take the next step. So it's an algorithmic structured visit um, sort of automating or semi-automating the things that the usual kinds of conversations we have uh, in the, the diagnostic interview we'd have in the office. Does that help? That helps immensely. Thank you. And you can sort of see where it's going. I mean, this is also going to be going everywhere, and you can certainly see how Amazon will want to be incorporating these into its, its kind of care that it will offer through its services um, because it is efficient, and members like it because it's available 24 hours a day uh, in real time without any waiting at all. Okay, um, both, um, Jeff, you still have your hand up. Are you done? And, and, and Tom, we should get a time check too. We have, um, we had a we, little- we, just, We're just, good with yeah. time. As I in good it's, as- in, it, it, Yeah, if you have another five or 10 minutes, that's great. Sounds good, thank you. Perfect. Um, I'll pick it back up. I just have one more. If you can advance one more slide, Rose. Um, so lastly, just wanted to, on the, in the virtual care space, just give you one more update, and that is our Get Care Now. Um, again, this is our live on-demand 24-7 virtual urgent care. Um, it was late, launched in late 2021. Um, through Q2 of 2022, um, when we looked at some of the top diagnoses, so the top five included COVID-19, um, upper respiratory infection, cough, sore throat, and urinary tr tract infection. Um, we've provided over 60,000 um, members um, with care through Get Care Now. And in 2023, um, we are projecting we, we will be providing care through this um, app um, to over 80,000 members, again, on this platform. As of Q4 2022, um, some good news, we are now licensed in all 50 states um, to deliver care to our members. Um, this would be great for our members who are traveling or um, students who are going to school out of state. Okay. And next, I'll turn it back to Dr. Bachman to talk about our health equity initiatives. Awesome. Uh, so health equity is really part of our founding principles, and we are not going to back up, back off on that. It's kind of Kaiser Permanente nationally uh, is focusing on health equity as we are in our region. I will give credit and some pride for the Oregon Health Authority, OEB and PEB, for pushing this issue uh, as a customer group. And uh, Sparn and I are always known to be the people asking the hard questions at the national level, uh, and they are acknowledging that the OHA related groups are really cutting edge and a leading indicator for where the whole healthcare system needs to go uh, in terms of looking at health equity, uh, the health equity lens for all the work that we do. Um, we have had for several years uh, culturally competent care delivered through our Salud and Espanol program at our Genders Pathway uh, Clinic um, uh, for gender related care. Um, we've seen good outcomes from those uh, and we will continue to support those. Um, we are uh, 
developing at Interstate, where I work, a Black Center of Clinical Excellence program as well in 2023. Where we're currently recruiting uh, physicians uh, with expertise to work in that uh, program, uh, and we're excited to use that as another um, uh, platform for improving uh, health equity. Um, we know that culturally competent care and when the care is delivered uh, by a clinician that comes from the community or looks like the member, um, we know that care is often better and those outcomes are demonstrable. So our commitment to health equity also goes in really rigor uh, in recruitment and hiring uh, and mentoring um, clinicians from all from all kinds of backgrounds uh, and other staff members uh, as well. So it, this commitment, we just know we're, we're with you on the journey for health equity. We know we have a long ways to go uh, to reach a state of health equity. Uh, we know that we are looking at it, looking for health disparities uh, and specifically doing programs to help remedy them. Uh, next, social determinants of health screening is happening regularly um, at, at the time electronically but prior every primary care visit where people are getting questions about their social needs uh, and then we're able to uh, link them and remedy them with our navigators uh, our uh, resource action centers and other ways for that um, one thing we're doing combining medical and dental uh, is having some mobile clinics uh, for uninsured uh, individuals and other communities uh, in the Northwest. Uh, and that's kind of outside our main delivery system, but we're also going to be able to uh, use it to fill care gaps uh, and bring the dental care and medical care uh, where they're needed. That's a partnership with Medical Teams International. Um, next slide. And then the community resource uh, directory is we can forward that link around to that, and that is through kp.org, but not uh, part of the private space with that. And this is really what our navigators and our social workers and our physicians and our ER staff were using to help people find resources in the community. But now we're proud that it's really available to anyone. Uh, we're all still we're still using part. It's still, it's part of the, it's one end of the Thrive Local program, uh, which is both the resource uh finder uh, and then resource linker and then that by uh, directional communication uh, between community organizations uh, and the healthcare delivery system with that i'm going to turn it to sapari for Perfect. uh discussion of mental health yeah just a couple of things here um next slide um we wanted to give you some stats on our ginger io which we launched in june of 2022 um, this application supplements our virtual therapy options, offering a greater diversity of providers and also expanding timely access to our members. Um, since this launch, um, we have um, over almost 2,400, as you can see, registrants. Um, the top utilizers fall into the 45 to 64 age band at about 34% followed by the 26 to 34 and 35 to 44 age band, each at 25%. Um, in addition to that, um, we have um, approximately 84% of our utilizers are female and 20% are male. And we are seeing some, um, some nice progress and improvements using this apps. 49.3% um, saw improvements in anxiety and 48.7% saw improvement in depression. And next slide. Um, wanted to tell you about um, our mental health appointing. So starting in November of 2022, our members can now schedule appointments directly into psychotherapy services via our member services call center or online without, without having to speak to an additional clinician. So really the goal behind this change is to make it easier for our members to schedule mental health appointments and to get care as soon as possible. Our members can self-refer for mental health therapy with a Kaiser Permanente provider, or they can contact a, a provider in the community, um, so no referral or intake is needed to schedule. Um, in addition, um, just a reminder that our behavioral health consultants are still available in our clinics um, for same-day and next-day appointment access. And lastly, um, Michelle Teeples, who I know has presented to this group before, she is our senior director leading our mental health and addiction medicine efforts, um, will be more than happy to report the data points from this initiative in our future meetings. And then Dr. Bachman, want to end us with dental? Yeah, just um, um, we're continuing to, we continue to believe in medical dental integration as 
uh, model of care that provides better outcomes all around. We certainly know some people tend to see the dentist and not the medical office, and we can get their medical care gaps, uh, immunizations, uh, scheduling for preventive services done in the dental office, uh, and vice versa. Um, so it really does matter. Uh, we also know that dental care is really a leading indicator for social needs and social determinants of health um, with large amounts of uh, disparities related to that we see in dental care. So it's another place to bring in that social determinants of health uh, to our work. Really proud that the dental team uh, was very active in giving vaccinations related to COVID uh, and are also giving flu shots uh, at times as well. So we think this is unique, uh, important, uh, one of the few models really in the country uh, with such high levels of medical and dental integration uh, for even for our commercial members. So um, the numbers there are the care gaps that were closed in proximity to a dental appointment um, by the nurses that work in the dental offices. Uh, and then by the staff in the dental offices uh, able to give flu shots. With that, that gets us to the end of our presentation. And thank you for listening. Thank you for hearing our enthusiasm for um, what was a challenging 2022, and I'm sure it'll be a challenging 2023. Uh, but despite the challenges that we're all aware of, um, reason for optimism and enthusiasm for uh, the new and innovative programs that we're bringing to uh, 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 our members. Thank you, Keith and Sapari. Any questions or comments from uh, CL members? Okay. Um, Rose, on our agenda, we have a, a break scheduled now. I'm not sure okay. if we. I'm not sure if we need a break, Phil. Does anybody need a break? If not, I'm going to suggest that we um, that we uh, plow ahead with uh, with Moda's presentation. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we're really excited to talk about some work that we've been working on for the last year or so, and also talk to you about some exciting programs that we'll be proposing for the 23-24 plan year. So first, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce the MODA team because um, we do have someone new with us today. Um, so first, I'm Erica Hedberg. I'm the Director of um, Government Programs for MODA. We also have Kara Stoudemire Phillips, who is our VP of DEI and Community Initiatives. We have April Canetto, who is our Director of um, Population Health. And we have Dr. Popovich, um, VP and Chief Medical Officer for MODA. So first we're going to get started doing um, an update on health equity and social determinants of health because that's gonna provide a really good um, basis for the programs that we'll be proposing. So we're gonna um, toss it on over to Karis to get us started. Thank you so much, Erica. Good morning, everyone and happy new year. So we will get going here. Okay, so our first slide talks about health, our health equity roadmap and our goal and our commitment in our health equity roadmap is driving better health through health equity. So we're going to walk through these three uh, photos that you see here. So first, number one, these are these are our three focus areas. So in priority. So number one, our members. And this includes data and intelligence, always quality first and social determinants of health and operations. Our second area, providers. Provider incentives, clinic support, social determinants of health, points of intervention. And then we're really excited about this third area, this third focus area, which is community. And what you'll see in that area are some new innovative ideas that um, we're going to share about later, but I'll just give you uh, those titles. Community Health Food Initiative, Volunteer Alignment, and exploring equity zones. So these are the three focus areas for us in our health equity roadmap. Again, members, providers, and community. Next slide, please. This next slide is a definition of what health equity is. And there's a lot of different definitions out there of what health equity is or is not. We have adopted using the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation 
definition for health equity, we believe that this is very all, all encompassing and really defines what we believe is the goal of achieving health equity. And I'm going to go ahead and read this one to you because I really want folks to, to listen to this one and understand it. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, and housing, safe environments, and health care. So as you, as you see, as I said, it's all encompassing and all of those factors are social determinants of health that feed into health equity outcomes. I know that many of you have seen um, the different diagrams that talk about equality um, and what equity is, and some of them have been the, there's a little one with us out there, there's a little boy that's looking over a fence, um, trying to look at a baseball game. This one, we really like this, um, this example. So uh, this is the one that we've chosen to um, use in our commitment. So equality, everyone gets the same resources. Sounds good, right? No, we want to move over to equity, where resources are distributed to reach an equal outcome. So you see the difference there, where you see the, the those um those uh stools or benches um, that the individuals are on. Equity is our goal. We just don't want equality. We want equity. Next slide, please. Now here's a real life example of health equity, and we just wanted uh, to share this. So do take a look at this and you'll see that it is um, the social determinants of health that really, really feed into how health, health, health equity outcomes. So you look at the life expectancy compared to Hispanic females, white females, Hispanic males, white males, black females, and black males in correlation with years of education. And we really felt like this was, um, as we were thinking about different um, examples of this, we really felt like this gave a really good picture of how social determinants of health really interface with those outcomes for social equity. We just ask that you look at that and think of this as something that we are absolutely considering in everything that we do. And this is an interesting one. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. I know I spent a lot of time on this one as well, but we will, you have the packet, so you can go back to it. Okay, this next slide, disparities in health outcomes. I want everyone to go to the bottom of this slide. Look at the roots of inequities. And we're gonna read all of them because these are really important. These are the root causes. Environmental toxins and hazards, poor quality of care, discrimination, housing, poverty, food provider implicit and explicit biases, poor quality of schools, racism, and being uninsured. These are all the root causes that create the outcomes that you see on the branches of this tree. Those disparities in health outcomes include diabetes, cancer outcomes, infant mortality, obesity, heart disease, malnutrition, smoking, substance abuse. It is so important to understand that these root causes cannot be separated from these health outcomes that create these disparities. It is these root inequalities, inequities that create the disparities in health outcomes. And that is our goal, is to combat these root inequities and increase health equity to have better outcomes and less disparities. Thank you, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague who's new to you all, and you'll be very interested in what she has to share, April. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to have a chance to meet with you. I'm beyond excited um, at what we're, what we're proposing and what we're really working on from an innovative perspective within MODA. And really what Karis has been describing to you all 
it really helps set the context for what we're going to be talking about here in a minute in terms of what we're going to be focusing on and proposing as we move into 2023 and beyond. And we really want to ensure that we're on the same page in terms of why and addressing those root causes, because that really is what is shaping the, the recommendations that we're putting together as we move more towards um, a sophisticated approach to health equity within MODA. And so when we're talking about the social determinants of health, I I really just like this language here because it's 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 lay terms, right? It really just helps us break down and understand. And these are all things I'm sure that you all really have a, a strong sense of, but it just helps us really just get kind of the same language being used universally across all of us. And again, this is what shapes the programs that we're designing within MEDA. And so it starts with, you know, health starts long before we're sick. It starts in our homes, our schools, and our jobs. And so when we're thinking about the strategies and the interventions, we have to be thinking about how we're going to be targeting where people live, work, play, learn, right, as you can see on number five. And so a lot of this really coincides with not just what the intervention needs to look like, but where the intervention needs to occur. If we're going to really focus on SDOH and move um, kind of upstream um, to, to then move towards health equity. Um, all Americans have the opportunity to make the choice that allows them to live a long and healthy life. And that's regardless to Karis's point of education, income, or their ethnic background. The, a, a, an individual's neighborhood or their job shouldn't be hazardous to their health. And what we see over and over again is that your neighborhood really does define the, your health. And that's what we're working on trying to, to really focus when we're talking about our community strategies that we're going to um, talk about here in a minute. And then the opportunity for health begins in our families, our neighborhood schools, jobs. So you see a lot of the same terminology being used over and over. And really just when you summarize all of this, it's saying we have to go to where the people are and focus on their environment in order to really affect change and start to address health equity. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm not sure if you all have seen this before. I like to iterate this or you know, just really emphasize this. Because, you know, we often think that when we're looking at intervening within health, we're looking at that bottom 20%, which is access to health care and the quality of health care. But truly, 80% of what determines our health has nothing to do with our access to health, with our access to care and the quality of care. It has to do with socioeconomic factors, our physical environment and our health behaviors. And so, again, when we're thinking about what is it that we want to do to actually influence an individual's health. If we're truly going to have a sustainable impact, we have to focus on that 80% while ensuring that we're sustaining the 20% around access and quality of care. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, this is to help paint the picture of what is the difference or why is, why is social determinants of health and health equity and kind of how are they interrelated? And I really love the visual of this. What you can see is that as you move from the right to the left, you move more and more upstream. What we're going to be talking about in our renewal, and as we move more and more into 2023, 2024, and 2025, is going to be focused on starting to move more and more to the left. Because what we know is that if we focus on the structural determinants, which as you can see are things around you know, socioeconomic and political context, it's things like governance, it's how our policies, zoning laws, that's really, truly where a lot of the root causes happen when we're talking about health inequities. What we're going to be focusing on in the short term is looking at things around socioeconomic, right? So how can we support looking at things related to race and ethnicity and ensuring that we're tailoring interventions in a very culturally sensitive way? How can we focus on things around income supports and social determinants of health related to, to food insecurity? That we start to get you know, upstream there, but not as upstream as when we go all the way to the left and we look at policies. And then when we go even more to the right, right, it's it's a little bit more of an immediate, right? It's the material circumstances. You're going to hear us talk about some of the opportunities that we have to influence in that sphere currently, looking at behaviors, biological factors, the health system, and psychosocial factors. So by influencing the continuum of this, we will get to the goal of health equity. The further to the left we go, the more sustainable the change will be. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So what does this mean within MODA? And Karis gave you guys a preview of this. And we have this slide in here twice because this really does frame what we're looking at doing in our 2023 
as, as really kind of the underpinnings of our work around health equity. And so within the member space, you're gonna, I'm gonna give you guys some details here in a minute around what we're gonna do around health equity dashboards, looking at populations by race, ethnicity, geography, benchmarking them to understand where we have differences in performance for OM members and really focusing on specific interventions in those areas and with those members where we see differences in outcomes based on those different demographic factors. Quality first is something that really drives the philosophy and the mission of MODA, but it's how do we incorporate health equity into that lens? And so we're gonna talk about when we're looking at PDSA cycles and quality improvement, how we're actually doing it specific to demographic factors where we have variability in performance and how we're going to intervene within that and, and focus our PDSAs in, in those areas as well. And then all of our social determinants of health strategies that we're going to be proposing around our members um, and the operations that have to happen within every department at MODA in order to truly start to move upstream. We're going to talk about provider. This can't, so the thing about health equity is it can't be within one silo. If we're truly going to impact health equity, it has to be a cross member provider and community. It's, it's a sophisticated, complex approach that has to happen in order to truly get to health equity. Um, and so within the provider space, we're starting to talk about equity-based contracting. What does that mean? How do we hold the hand of our providers to provide them support within their clinic when we're looking at differences in performance on their clinical panels? How do we then incentivize them to ensure that they're supporting and culturally tailoring their services in an appropriate way? And then how do we give them the tools, right? How do we ensure that the providers have the tools that they then need to be able to provide supports within their clinic? And then to Karis's point, in the community space, how do we start to align our volunteer opportunities with where we want to have a larger footprint around SCOH in our neighborhoods and health of our neighborhoods? So we're going to talk about food and how food initiatives are going to be able to align around our members as well as within our communities. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so what does this actually mean from an operational perspective? So really, and you know, Kaiser, I love what you said as well about how this is a part of just who you are. It's a part of what health plans, it's a part of their DNA, it has to be in order for us to be successful. And so when we're looking at health equity at MODA, what we're talking about is data, integration, intelligence, and then accreditation. And so what we're proposing for 2023 from a data perspective is to really enhance our data capture as it relates to health equity um, and social determinants of health. So what does that mean? I know you guys have heard a lot about MODA360 and the work that's being done with MODA360 to capture um, SDOH as well as race and ethnicity and other factors. We're also in the process of adding indirect data into that. There's only so much data that we're going to get from members directly. There's always going to be a gap that we have to be able to address. So what are some other data sources that we can pull in so that we have a 360 degree view of all of our members at a population level and can actually analyze that data? And then how do we streamline all of this into our systems in a meaningful way? There's a significant amount of work happening at MODA right now within all of our different systems to ensure that we have the correct capturing of the data and the flow of that data so that we can actually move into intelligence. And so I'm gonna go a little, a little bit out of order here. So when we go from data, then we really it's moving into intelligence. So once we have the accurate data capture, which we're working on in 2023, and I've already started, then it's moving into, okay, what do we do with that data? I've done health equity work for a really long time and it's it's and just population health work in general. And there's so much information to look at. We have to have a way to distill that down and make meaningful, actionable decisions that truly drive health equity. So what does that mean? So what we're looking at doing is actually designing a health equity dashboard. So what that will do is it will show us at a population level where individuals within OEB live and how their performance based on race, ethnicity, geography, different you know, non-English languages spoken, how their performance is better, worse, or the same as a benchmarked population. And on a dashboard, we would be able to look at zip codes. And that goes to what Karis was talking about is starting to explore health equity zones to really understand where do we have an opportunity to start to pilot some work in specific areas with specific populations that's really about population health and improving health equity. And so those the dashboards that we're talking about is something that we're proposing that we would implement in 2023 to design and then go ahead and um, operationalize and have live by 2024. We also wanna be able to produce a baseline reporting for OEB. 
so that we can come and show you, here's what your population looks like based on these demographics, broken down by HEDIS, broken down by utilization. So we can understand again, against those benchmarks, where do we have different impacts as it relates to cost and quality? And where should we be focusing our quality improvement strategies that we're very proactive and deliberate about how we're designing our work. And then through that, we'll be establishing annual benchmarks based on that benchmarking where we sit now, where we wanna be year over year, and then showing you guys our progress on that as it relates to our quality improvement plans. We're also working on integration. And so proposing that is something that we're really gonna be focused on in 2023. So things like holding our vendors accountable. This work can't start and stop with an internal department within a health, within a health plan. It has to be fully integrated into everything that we think about from an operations perspective. So when we're looking at vendor contracts, all of our downstream entities, how are we holding them accountable to health equity? Are they reporting on differences in populations that they're serving? Are we asking them you know, to actually improve their performance based on benchmarking and differences? So that's what we'll be doing in 2023 is starting to incorporate that into our contractual language for all of our downstream entities. We're also gonna be establishing SDOH interventions. And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide and what that's gonna look like around our healthy food program. And then implementing actual performance improvement projects specific to health equity. So once we've identified those benchmarks and where we wanna have improvements, doing some pilots that really focus on specific um, quality improvement and utilization reduction projects specifically around equity. And then all of the alignment of that with our MOTA 360 and CARE 360 and our population health equity work. The last piece of that integration, I talked about it a little bit on the clinical slide with our providers, but it's moving into equity-based contracting. And there's a lot of opportunity in this space nationally and especially you know, within our region as well. But as we start to think about how do we really work with our providers in a meaningful way, again, we can't just do this within a department, within a health plan. If we're going to impact health equity, we have to bring our providers along with us. So it's looking at our higher volume providers initially, it's looking at their clinical panel. It's identifying where they have inequities occurring on utilization and in quality, and then working with them to actually incentivize them to reduce that gap in performance. And then I'm really excited to talk about accreditation. So one of the things that we're going to be doing or we're proposing to do in MOTA in 2023 is to build our, our foundation for health equity accreditation. And I don't know if you all are familiar with health equity accreditation from NCQA, but it's a, it's a product that came from what used to be multicultural healthcare distinction, and now it's evolved over into health equity accreditation. And it's a set of six different standards um, that health plans have to go through and show and prove that they meet the, the requirements. And it includes the, the how robust our race ethnicity data is, our integration of SDOH, everything I've talked about in terms of our systems and our intelligence and our dashboard and our quality improvement projects are all embedded within the health equity accreditation product for NCQA. And so what we're proposing is that we actually use that to help build out our foundation, and then we would obtain the accreditation in 2024 for, for our commercial product. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Then lastly, from an SDOH perspective, right, we talked about how social determinants of health are at the root of what we're going to, what we need to do to focus and really drive towards health equity. What we're proposing is to really start to have a very large footprint in one key area of SDOH. While we continue to build out all of our other work around operations and coordination and resource support with our members. Um, so what we're really looking at doing is building out um, a food program. And we've done a ton of research on this. And we know that when we're looking at populations, especially populations with chronic conditions, such as diabetes and hypertension, and populations that traditionally have been um, disadvantaged, right? So when we're talking about by race, by ethnicity, or by where an individual lives and their lack of access to quality nutritional food, this is an area where we can save a significant amount uh, of money for OEB is, you know, across our health systems because we know that food really is medicine and drives health outcomes while also ensuring that we're facilitating long-term health of our members. And so what we're looking at doing is having a transitions of care, medically tailored meal program for type two diabetics. So diabetics who are inpatient for over 24 hours and discharge home would then receive a certain number of medically tailored meals delivered to their home. Additionally, then they would be eligible along with a broader population for our full food as medicine program that we're proposing. 
And Erica is going to go into much more details about this, but at a high level, it will also be targeted initially in 2023 for type 2 diabetics. And it will be a program where our, our, your OEB members will be able to actually receive um, matching dollars for healthy food, as well as health coaching programs and nutrition programs, how to shop for healthy food, how to cook healthy food. And it would be something that would be available for the family unit and not just for the individual, because we know that behavior change requires really happening within the family and not just within one individual. If it's, if, if it's a, for example, a mother who has type 2 diabetes, she's not going to be able to change her eating if she's preparing separate meals for herself and what she's preparing for the rest of her family. So the food and medicine program will broaden um, our ability to support our type 2 diabetics and really integrate healthy food as, as a medicine program. It will also then support them with, um, with, a, with our VERTA program, which will be a way for them to get really a strong ROI, proven evidence around um, a healthy food um, digital application where they'll receive real-time coaching in addition to the food that's delivered to them. And that's a that nutrition management program. We're also proposing enhancing our language services. That's really a foundational piece when we're talking about health equity. We have to ensure that we're providing care to all of our members, regardless of, of their nation of origin or language that is spoken. And so we're proposing that we enhance that to be providing clinical coverage for interpreter services. And we would do a very um, broad and detailed outreach campaign with our providers and our members related to that. And then we're also proposing flex funds that would be accessed through our um, population health team, where if an individual with an OLEB member was needing support around specific SDOH needs, let's say, for example, they might need uh, support with pest control and their child has asthma, or they might need support with paying their housing application to move into a better home for their family. Those are things that we would be able to use a flex fund for in order to support the members with, with day-to-day needs as it relates to SDOH. At the provider level then, we would be working on how we start to integrate all of this into our provider portal with population health reporting so that providers can also access our SDOH programs and understand the health of their population that they're serving. We would also be aligning our value-based contracting. I talked about that a little bit before, around equity-based contracting, starting to move towards really incentivizing SDOH support as well as health equity outcomes in our provider space. And then we'll be executing our quality improvement work plans specific to SDOH and, um, and health equity within our providers. So this is about us going in, identifying providers, sitting down with them, process mapping with them, providing resources for them, to be able to really move towards equity and providing SDOH support to OEB members. And then within the community, we're looking at piloting a community food program, which would include potentially working with one specific area that would be able to, um, probably in a non-urban area where they would be able to have resources to build out a community garden within a school and then support community education and access to the food from the community garden. Erica, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, but I'm happy to take any questions. I know that was a ton of information. Thank you so much, April. Um, April just did a fantastic job of um, providing background information on the work that we've been doing, as well as exciting work that um, we have coming up. And she also gave a high-level overview of the programs that we're proposing. So I'm going to dive in just a little bit deeper into that section that April just went over on the member side. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is that we're going to be proposing covering health-related services. And for people who might be a little bit more familiar with um, the CCOs and involved in the CCO world, maybe you've heard this term before. But health-related services are non-covered services under the plan that are intended to improve care delivery and overall member and community health and well-being. So coordinated care organizations or CCOs um, already are providing coverage for health-related services. And that includes our own EOCCO or Eastern Oregon CCO as well. And the Oregon Health Authority has really supported the CCOs in providing this coverage. And the OHA has even identified health-related services as the primary strategy by which CCOs can help address their members' SCOH needs. Um, yeah, I see a question, Robert. Yeah, Erica, could you give an example of what a health-related service would be? Yes, I'm actually going to dive down into that, into okay. the different health-related services that we'll be proposing. Um, so yes, I'll be getting there on the next slide, um, and on this slide. Thanks, Robert. Um, 
because so the CCOs provide, you know, coverage for a lot of different health related services. And we're going to be focusing on three of those services for the upcoming year. And as April mentioned, um, we are proposing to start small and pilot this with our type two diabetic members for this year. But Moda really does have plans to expand um, coverage for these services in future years because we really do believe that by reducing barriers to accessing the healthcare system and reducing barriers and being able to manage a member's health will have a positive impact on additional populations as well. Um, yes, Tom. Oh, you're muted, Tom. Oh, okay. You want me to yeah, keep no, going? Sorry, oh, no. I, I, when uh, I've heard about uh, CCOs and having providing health related services, you know, examples were like air conditioners, you know, for people who are at risk. Uh, what percentage of the uh, uh, of the budget of the total CCO budget would fall into this category? Was it one percent, five percent? I know it's not. 10 percent uh and uh and then as you go through your presentation it would be helpful to get a sense of again what percentage of premium are you looking at putting into these uh categories yes um thank you tom and i will have more information on the percent of premium with um the next uh meeting that we have i won't have the okay. percent of premium impacts with this presentation um, okay. But that is something That's, that we're working on. Yeah, I just, I mean, it, it's it's one of the things that we need to hear as time moves, as things move forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thank you. Uh, Moda is going to be proposed, or we are proposing to add coverage for three different health-related services for the upcoming plan year. And so those three categories would be food benefits, flex funds, and then expanding our coverage for interpretation services. So I'm going to go into details on each of these um, benefits. So the next slide, please, Rose. So first, we're going to talk about food benefits. And April has already done a good job of um, really describing how food really is medicine and how it can eating healthy can support members and their health, especially members with chronic conditions. And I think we all know, especially as we're coming out of the holiday season, it can be very difficult to um, eat nutritious foods, especially if uh, there are barriers to being able to access healthy food. So there are a lot of different barriers to access. Um, one example of a barrier to access is availability. So if there are not stores that are nearby that actually sell healthy food, then that can be an access to members actually being able to, um, to buying and using healthy foods for preparing meals. Another barrier to access could be transportation. Um, maybe somebody doesn't have reliable transportation, maybe a store is, you know, 20, 30 miles away, but if they don't have reliable transportation to be able to get to that store, that can be uh, a barrier to accessing healthy food. And another barrier can be um, financial barriers. We all know that um, eating healthy or buying healthy foods can oftentimes be more expensive than buying non-nutritious foods. So for members who have some financial difficulties, it can be hard to actually make that, that lifestyle change in um, preparing healthy foods for themselves and their families. So as April described, one of the benefits that we're proposing is a medically tailored meal program. So this will be initially focused on our type 2 diabetic members who have recently been discharged from the hospital. And we are proposing to send them freshly prepared meals right to their home. And this would be at no cost to the member. Um, so next slide, Rose, I want to talk you, take you through just a little bit of a member experience. So how this would look for the member. So when members are discharged from the hospital, we receive that notification. So when we get that, then we will reach out to the members and we'll have one of our Care360 navigators reach out to the members. And as they're talking with that member, they will describe the food benefit that they have available to them. And at that time, the navigator can help get them set up on their initial meals because we really want to get this started so that we can get the meals sent out to the member into their home. And you the average time, it usually takes just a couple of days from when we um, first initiate that order to the food actually being delivered to the member's house. So the uh, navigator will work with the member just to identify any preferences for food, allergies, um, or you know maybe things that they just don't like. We don't want to send them, if they don't like tomatoes, we don't want to send them tomatoes because then they're not going to eat the healthy food. 
Um, at that same time, the navigator can help the member get set up with a digital app. And when the member gets set up with that digital app, then they can actually go in and set their preferences and manage their food benefit themselves. So they can go in and they can identify any cultural or lifestyle preferences they might have for their foods. They can um, identify allergies, you know, and preferences there. And the benefit will provide up to two weeks of meals that will be delivered to the member's doorstep. And members, this will be delivered throughout the entire state of Oregon, even in the rural areas, as well as nationally. So the benefit will be available to members who live um, anywhere in the country. And after the navigator works with that member, they're not just done. Um, that member is now involved in our um, CARE 360 program, and the navigator will be you know, checking in with the member um, for, to ensure that they're um, doing all right and see if they have any questions with their food benefit. So any questions about that um, medically tailored meal program? This one is really meant to be more of an you know, meeting more of an acute need. So when members are being discharged, and I'm gonna go into our food as medicine program, which is really gonna be looking at more of a long-term um, support. So any questions before I move on? This is Tom. The question that I have is whether or not, um, uh, how, whether or not this type of program has been piloted before, uh, whether or not there's, you know, kind of some science behind it, or you guys on the leading edge? Yeah, um, I'm going to start this and then I'm going to pass this over to April. Um, we currently have not rolled this program out to anybody um, on our mode of plans. This would be brand new and we'll be using learnings from our EOCCO to implement it for OEB. But April, um, can you better answer that question? Yeah, um, and I'm actually one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this program is there is a really strong scientific base for, um, for really food as medicine and medically tailored meals. And we actually put some information together, happy to send it over to you guys, that shows a lot of um, national research, academic research that's been done that actually shows what the return on investment is for this type of a program. When we talk about type 2 diabetic members, we're piloting it with that population specifically because we know that there's a really strong ROI with that population. We're talking about a medically tailored meal and a food as medicine program. And so we're starting out within MODA, where we know all of, there's an abundance of, of literature that supports that we should see a really strong return, not just on the member's quality of life, but also on reduction of things such as inpatient admission, sure. length of stay, as well as emergency room reduction. So, so really, when you really break it down, and this is why I'm just so excited about it, it not only will save our health system money, it'll save OAB money, but it will also make our members healthier. So it's it's a win win when we're thinking about it from a strategy perspective. That's great, Jeff. You're on. Yeah, how is the cost of this program passed on? Is it a, a claim cost or is it outside the plan? Or just from a general accounting standpoint. Yeah, Jeff, that's a good question, and it will be um, a claims cost that'll be um, that'll come <laughs> through on the claims bill. So. Um, because it has a claim impact, um, I think we would like to, I'd like to see the <clears throat> more formal uh, ROI presented. Yeah, we'll be, we are currently. Sounds great, here. but I just yeah. due diligence. <laughs> Those are the important details, um, Jeff and Tom, and we are working on pulling together those costs. Um, because we are going to be utilizing a vendor for this program as well. And we are also pulling together um, the ROI because we do believe that there are savings associated with the program. Yes, Jeff. I'm just trying to figure out how to take my hand down. Oh. Yeah. So the, <laughs> well, the next, the, the other question is, you know, again, speaks to the issue of, <clears throat> of health equity is the idea that this would be available to everyone who's post-hospital mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes, or would it be to populations who are at risk? Uh, you know, I can imagine, um, you know, someone who is, um, who would really needs the help, the service, and others that it would not, that they can afford 
this. And I, I wonder whether or not that's already embedded in that first step, the CARE 360 will contact members. Actually, it would be um, the first two, whether or not the, the uh, yeah. again, if, if I was in this situation, I, I look and say, would, would I need that type of help or could I, that's something that I could manage versus someone who uh, couldn't afford or couldn't obtain the healthy food. Yes, thanks. And I'm actually going to pass this over to April um, okay. to take to respond to. Thanks, Erica. So there's, you know, there's a lot of options for how we might want to slice this. But really, when you look at the literature on it, what, what the literature shows is that, especially when we're talking about medically tailored meal programs, when someone is discharged home, even if they have the means to obtain healthy food, we're talking about type 2 diabetics it often goes back to, and Gail, please jump in here from a clinical perspective, but it often goes back to really behavior change, goes back to things associated with diet and weight. And so even if someone may have the means, there hasn't been a behavioral shift where they're actually really able to control their diabetes okay. through a, a healthy food program. And so what the literature really shows is that by supporting them, especially when you're coming home from the hospital, you're already um, less likely to be able to easily prepare food because you're you're sick, right? You were just inpatient. You may not be able to get to the supermarket and purchase what you're needing or even really have the wherewithal to plan out, you know, diabetic tailored meals over the next one to two weeks. So this type of program will basically take that stress off of the member and start them on a journey where they're able then to have diabetically tailored meals delivered to them. So they can start on that behavior change. And then we'll start working with them long-term um, through the Food as Medicine program to really support a much longer-term behavior change. That's Some of right. the research studies- that, awesome. That's good. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I appreciate that. <laughs> no yeah. problem. It's, so it's, 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 it's a quick. program for all and, and that's It's fine. a program for all, but however yeah. saying that, there, when we're talking about the food as medicine program, there is the opportunity yeah, to really right. tailor that to members yeah. that have identified SDOH needs. And I've seen research on both and both have strong outcomes, but we're open to looking at how we might want to do that in a way that's going to work best with LAB. Our recommendation is going to be to pilot it with all and actually to do an academic study, which we've already started talking about within MODA, um, and, and maybe even do that partnership with LAB to show how this applies to the commercial population and how it does reduce utilization and ED spend um, so we can scale the program long-term. We're trying to do it in a way where the population is small enough so the cost impact won't be very large so we can show the success and then scale it from there. Super. Thank you, April. Um, and that actually takes us right into the next slide, uh, Rose, if you'll move forward. Um, April talked about how that uh, medically tailored meals are really focused on that acute need, but then transitioning members into the longer term behavioral change, which is our food as medicine program. And so through this program, members will receive produce and pantry boxes that are also delivered right to their door. Um, the food deliveries are culturally and lifestyle relevant and sourced from local farms and suppliers um, when available. Um, obviously, there are different times of the year that uh, local produce is more abundant than in other times of the year. And as April also mentioned um, a little while ago, the box will include food for up to a family of four. And April already mentioned this, so we'll just briefly hit on it. Um, if, if we're only sending food to the target member, but everybody else in the household is preparing something different for dinner, then that could be a very, it could be more difficult for that target member to actually sustain the, the behavioral change that we're really aiming for. Um, through the program, members will also have access to the digital app, and that app provides personalized support for the member, and then they can use that app to customize their nutrition box. Again, if they don't like tomatoes, we don't want to send them tomatoes because they're not going to use that um, to prepare their meals. Um, then they can really control um, the boxes that are being sent to them through that. The app also will support members um, by providing them recipes to be able to use the food that they get to actually prepare the healthy meals. Because if you're not used, if you get a box and it contains a bunch of food that you're not used to preparing meals with, it can be very overwhelming. I know I would be very overwhelmed with a box full of food that I didn't, I, I don't have any experience using. So the recipes are really there to help support members and being able to use that food to, um, to cook that meal. 
And the app is there to help support them in um, learning how to even shop for that produce. So we start with giving them the food and teaching them how to use that food to prepare meals. And then it's really more of a long-term behavioral change where then we shift into helping support members and teach members on how to shop for that food so that they can um, create the healthy meals for their family. The program is intended to be more long-term. So really looking at more of a six month program to really implement that behavior change. Yes, Robert. Thanks, Erica. Is this program part of the, uh, the food is medicine program, part of the uh, Medicaid, medically tailored meal program? Uh, and is it the same target group? It is the same target group. And the answer to that is yes and no. So um, we will be transitioning members who might start in that acute phase into the food is medicine program. But um, the food is medicine program is also available to others outside of that. But it is targeted initially at that type two um, diabetic population. And April, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Just one, one um, caveat to it. So the food is medicine program, the difference is, is it's not going to be targeted only to members that have a recent inpatient stay. It's going to be targeted to type 2 diabetics that have uncontrolled um, HB and C levels. So we're still toying around with what that level will be. We're, we're, we're hoping for a 7.5 or above, which research really supports. But we're wanting to ensure that our data um, that we're able to obtain will match that based on how fetus is reported. So don't want to get into the weeds, but basically it'll be uncontrolled diabetics that are type 2. Whereas the, the medically tailored meal program will be those that also had an inpatient stay and then they can transition over to this. If they have an inpatient stay, most likely they're also uncontrolled. Okay. So obviously a lot more de details about the program over time in terms of, of <clears throat> budget and all of that, but definitely we're, we're hearing the, uh, what's behind, the theory behind it, the potential rollout, the potential populations. And um, it's very, uh, again, very innovative. And um, we'll see how it works. Great. Thank you, Tom. All right. So, any other questions about the food program before I move on to um, Flex Funds? Great. Next slide, please, Rose. And, and, and Erica, you have uh, 25 more minutes total. Perfect. We can do that. Um, so the next level of the next program that we're um, proposing is to cover flex funds. So members can experience barriers to being able to access the health care system or to manage their health. And one way that we just described was through food. Um, however, members can also experience other barriers to accessing the health care system or managing their health. And each of those barriers can be unique to them. So we're proposing to provide flex funds that can be accessed through our SDOH Care 360 team to provide coverage for services to help members remove those barriers, even for services that are not covered by the plan today. Um, the CCOs, including our own EOCCO, um, cover this benefit. And we're modeling our program off of the EOCCO program, but really tailoring it to fit the OEB population. And so I wanna give just a few examples of what this might look like, because I think that'll probably be the best way to help describe the program at a high level. So one example is transportation to an appointment. So that can be something that the flex funds cover. And an example of this, um, we have uh, Moda 360 advocates in, at Moda, and one of their jobs is to reach out to some of our higher risk members and help them with all sorts of things. But one thing that they help members with is um, in closing uh, gaps in care. So I was talking to one of our, or a couple of our advocates, and they were saying that oftentimes they will help members who maybe need a preventive exam like a colonoscopy. So they'll help the members find the provider. They even help the members schedule the appointment for the procedure. But they said that a lot of times, more than half of the time, those members actually end up canceling their appointment. And when I heard that, I was just really shocked because I felt like, well, a big part of that is done, you know, when you get the appointment scheduled. And I just asked, well, why, why is that happening? Do you know? And they said with some procedures, especially colonoscopy, you know, they have medication that's given during the appointment. So a member has to have a care person with them or reliable transportation in order to have the procedure done. So you can't just drive yourself home after that procedure and you can't take an Uber or Lyft. So if a member doesn't have a care person or a way to get home, then they have to cancel the appointment because they can't have the procedure done. So I asked the advocate, I said, so if they had 
you know, access to medical transportation, then could they have the appointment? And the answer is yes. And so that's just an example of a way that we can use these funds to help our members access the healthcare system and access the preventive exams that they need. Other examples, and um, Tom, I'm glad you brought this up because I know we've all heard about the air conditioner example. Um, Dr. Kitzhaber really used this when he was sharing his vision of the CCOs back in the beginning. And But I still think it's a very relevant example. And if you think about a member who has chronic conditions or a chronic condition, and let's say they live you know, in a place, maybe an apartment building on the second or third floor, and they don't have an air conditioner. Well, we know that parts of Oregon in the summer can get very hot. It feels like maybe they're getting hotter in recent years. And when a member doesn't have an air conditioner, it can really exasperate their condition, which can lead them to needing to um, end up in the ED or um, seeing their provider in the hospital. So by providing something as simple as an air conditioner, it can help the member really manage their health and chronic conditions better. Um, the flex funds can also be used um, to provide items that improve mobility. So members who may have um, limited mobility by helping them be able to access and move around a little bit more, it can actually help them manage their chronic conditions better as well. And one thing I like to point out with these flex funds is the purpose of them. So the purpose of the funds is to support members with an SDOH need and help them establish a permanent plan to meet that need. So the intention is not for these funds to be the permanent solution, but rather it's intended to be the bridge to a permanent solution. There are a lot of resources that are available in the community to be able to help members, but sometimes it can take um, time in order to be able to find and connect with those resources. So these funds are really um, aimed at being that bridge to helping members get to a more long-term solution. Um, and, and that's really the way that the CCOs are providing this benefit today to the members. So our initial proposal for focused on our type two diabetes, again, you know, we wanna start small with this and look to expand it later. So we'll be looking to uh, roll out these flex funds for that um, type two diabetic population as well. And we're proposing for the initial year to allow up to a $200,000 annual maximum um, or cap on those funds that our SDOH team can use. And again, more details um, underneath that with the next round. Any questions or comments on the flex, fund, flex funds? Sounds great. Great. Anything else to add, April? Well, then I'll go to our um, third uh, health-related service. Um, we are ex proposing to expand our language services. So today, Mona provides coverage for translation and interpreter services when a member interacts with us. So for example, if a member reaches out to a health navigator um, and let's say they speak Russian, we will bring a translator on who speaks Russian so that we can have a conversation and communicate with that member. We also provide a lot of our documents or our documents are all available in other languages. If we don't already have that document translated into the language that the member needs, then we will have that document translated for them. However, when a member interacts with the healthcare system, so when they're with our with their provider, we don't cover an interpreter at that point. So for example, if a member speaks Spanish and they go to their provider's office and nobody at that provider's office speaks Spanish, then that member has a, a barrier to accessing care because they can't communicate effectively with their provider. So we are proposing to expand our coverage to cover um, interpreter services for members at the provider's offices. Um, this is something that the CCOs cover today. So we will be looking to utilize the relationships that we have with vendors that our um, EOCCO is using and to expand these services to the OF members. Um, the way it's used today, it uh, covers both in-person and virtual interpreter services. So for example, a provider can ask for an actual, you know, we'll do a request for an interpreter. And that may mean that an actual person will be there in the office doing the translation but it can also mean a virtual interpretation. So um, providers offices might have an iPad and then they log into the interpre interpretation service there and that interpretation is done virtually. And that can be helpful when you're thinking about access issues or if you're thinking about providers offices in um, maybe more remote areas of the state where it can be more difficult or challenging to get an actual person there. Um, and that's the way the CCOs utilize that service today. Any question about that? Um, I am. Uh, I understand what you just said. Um, does your contracts with your providers 
require that they provide uh, interpreter services? I do not believe so, no. Okay, I'm very surprised by that because I, I've been operating with the idea that um, uh, a misinterpretation of our conversations around <clears throat> language uh, uh, services, that that already was in place. Yeah, and I will confirm that, but Tom, I do not believe so. Okay. And and maybe I can add to that. I can't speak directly to what's in our provider contract, Tom, but in relation to what you're talking about, um, as you probably know, it is federal law that providers, right, at the point of service need to be able to have access or they need to be able to provide, a member basically needs equal access. So they need to be able to have access to okay. lang uh, you know, language services that will support them in their health care journey at any yeah. point of contact, hospitals, clinics, health plans, right? Okay. And so a lot of times how- So it's covered through that, that, that direction, okay. Exactly. Okay. So often- Because I thought it was, I, I just- It is yeah, legally. I, yeah, okay. But a lot of providers don't, or they'll use a minor. Or they'll use someone that, can, even though there's laws recently against that with the ACA, it's just a really significant barrier. So if there's one general point of delivery for language services, it eases the burden on providers, which improves the ability for them to access it, which means that members will get a higher quality service by doing something like this. Yeah. Jeff, question? So this service uh, is in, uh, in addition to what's that providers being reimbursed, is that correct? Um, That's in other words, the provider doesn't have to absorb the cost of this? That's correct. Okay, because in the past, one of the unintended consequences is that a provider would be required to provide a translator and the translator would cost them what the, re the negotiated rate was and they're going, why do I want to treat people where I lose money or don't make anything? And so yeah. it needs to be an integrated approach. Correct, Jeff. And that's a good point. And yes, this would be through the vendor. So the provider would not be, it would, it would be us covering the charge of the provider using the vendor. And I do know that, you know, some providers today already use translator services. Some of them might because they do that to serve their members. But as April pointed out, uh, it is not something that every provider does. Yeah, we don't want to solve one problem and create an access problem. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so I'm going to pass this over to um, Dr. Popovich um, for really quick to talk about a program that we feel complements um, the food programs that we've been rolling out. Um, Dr. Popovich? Okay. Thanks, Erica. And thank you, Karis and April. And Happy New Year to all of you. Um, so all of what we've been discussing, and particularly the food as medicine program, to me is um, is very near and dear to my heart. I I truly believe that one of the inherent problems with our healthcare system is that we approach disease conditions as individual entities without looking at sort of the whole patient as as how we can improve things. And there's no better way to do that than with healthy food. And uh, with our type two diabetics, as you know, you know we we we've been taking our diabetes uh, approach in many different ways. We've approached it from our pre-D program to to try to uh, uh, preempt and prevent people from becoming actual type two diabetics, and then we also have had implemented and have implemented with great success Livongo for our patients who are diabetic. But Verda is a vendor I am sure many of you are already familiar with. Um, but it's a it is a pretty uh, amazing program that is is their goal is to reverse to type reverse type two diabetes as best they can. Is it going to completely eradicate it in every patient? Absolutely not. But what they offer is a program that will help help lower blood sugar, reduce medications, and ultimately lose weight. It's a physician guided program. Um, app based uh, through your through the app or through your computer. Uh, they provide all of the um, diabetic supplies like Livongo does with a glucometer, a connected glucometer to the app as well as a connected scale. And an MD is monitoring everything that's happening. Um, they they will review current medications that a type two diabetic is coming into the program with. 
they will send that member to a lab to to get a baseline A1C level, or they can just base it off of claims data, and then help set goals for that for that member. Um, they do, and we're we'll go into a lot more detail about Verda um, again at our next uh, our next meeting. But they they uh, put their fees at risk. Uh, they will reduce A1C by at least one over 1.3 points. They will reduce insulin, and this is another fee at risk. They will reduce insulin requirements by up to 94, up to 94 percent of patients who, who enroll in the program, and they'll also decrease medications. Which, um, by by reducing just insulin alone, the cost savings right there are pretty tremendous. So we we plan to offer this through Moda 360. Uh, it has tremendous synergy with our food benefit and this food as medicine program to help support members in this journey to um, to get access to fresh produce, meat, fish, and poultry, which can be a barrier for some. And we feel that this program, the food as medicine program, will really help members get on the right pathway to eating better, and Verda will help with that as well. They, they want you know that that's something that I've talked to them about. You know, like how do, how do you handle you know your lower income patients, and they have solutions um, that menu plans, diet plans, and you know some say it's strictly a keto program, and it's really not strictly keto. Keto is part of it, but it's much much more than that. And uh, very excited to to add this sort of final piece into our approach to our diabetic patients. So that's all I'll say about it for now. I'm happy to answer any questions about Verda, but more to come for sure. Is anybody in Oregon using it now? Do you know? They are. Yes. Uh, I believe Providence is using it with PEB, I believe. Yeah, th yeah, this is Margaret. That's correct. We did start Verda with um, the PEB group um, with Providence just this year. So still early um, and expect to have some data on on sort of initial experience relatively soon here. Right. Do, do you, Margaret, do you have any uh, early uh, just member satisfaction information or is it still just all too new? It's still all too new. Um, I think one one thing to think about, and, and one thing I'm curious about, and I don't know, Dr. Popovich, if you have any thoughts to share now, but in terms of, so Verda, you know, when you sort of look at the population level statistics, there's potentially a lot of people who could be eligible for the program. So I'm wondering if it, and it may be a little bit early in your planning, but have you given thought to sort of like targeting and recruitment and how you plan to sort of identify, will there be like a, sort of a member a member opt-in self-identification or sort of how will all that all of that work because um you know i think there are there are members out there who could certainly benefit from this who don't even really realize it's a thing that they could benefit from so just wondering if you have any thoughts on that at this point yeah I, I, and erica may have more data about this than me but i would say the one thing i do know about verda is they have an extremely high retention rate you know and any any lifestyle modification program whether it, you know whatever it may be is always going to come down to patient motivation like you know if a patient is not motivated to want to change their diet and lifestyle they're not going to do it um, verda maintains an 83 percent retention of patients after a full year which is pretty remarkable um, considering it is a program that does require you to um, to change your lifestyle in a pretty dramatic way, but they're very supportive in how they do that. The app, you know, they reach out to you, they text you, they um, they 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 really are very very hands on with the patients. In terms of the rollout, maybe Eric, you, Erica, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and how how we would like to make this available. Yeah, so Margaret, that's a great question, and it's a question that we are um, beginning to talk about. So we will be targeting the members that we invite into the program. Um, we will not be doing it where we um, put it out. We're, like we won't be sending out a mass email to the entire OEB population inviting them into the program. We will be looking at our data similar to the way we've been doing within the entire Moda 360 platform, where we look at what programs are right or best for what members and then targeting those members with the programs. So it, it will not be a, a huge wide rollout of the Verda program, at, at least initially, not at first. Right. We we don't we don't want to just dive in head first. I think targeting the most at need for this program would be the best way to start. And then we can always ramp it up as the years go. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks. Erica, you've got 10 more minutes. Okay. 
April, did you have something to add? Yeah, just real quick, I was going to add that um, the way we're looking at designing this is that the VERTA component will be the same population that's eligible for the Food as Medicine program. And so we'll really be tailoring this to the population that meets those parameters of our uncontrolled type 2 diabetics. But looking at it from a pilot perspective at around, I mean, we'll be, we're still working on the numbers, but probably around 200 members initially for the pilot phase. Then we'll be doing the evaluation, showing the ROI, and then hopefully to scale that in 2024. Thanks. All right. In Great. 10 minutes, Thank I, you. I, can, I can do, Tom. Um, I know you can. Two more, two more slides, Rose. All right. So I just have one more um, program or change to discuss today, and it is on dental. Um, and it is uh, preventive services for children. So most of you probably don't know, but I am gonna take a second just to talk about this. Um, but MoDA actually has a long history of providing dental care for children. And actually the ODS companies or the Oregon Dental Services companies uh, were actually founded on this um, when the International Longshoresmen Union um, were looking for a way to provide affordable dental care for the children of its members. So we got our, star our start in really looking at providing care for dental care for children. And I also just want to highlight that OEB has really partnered with us um, through the years in promoting preventive utilization on our dental plans through innovative benefit design. And as Mercer and Willis Harris Watson have shown, um, the Delta Dental plans have uh, you know, pretty high um, preventive utilization on our plans. And so a change that OEB just added for this current plan year that I'm so excited about is the Preventive First program. And I love this program because it allows members to be able to access uh, more preventive services. And it does this by making preventive services not subject to the annual um, benefit maximum. And those charges don't accrue towards the annual benefit maximum. So if members have, you know, maybe they have a year where they have, you know, an implant or um, root canals, um, and they are really using that, you know, the majority of that annual benefit maximum, they can still get their preventive services because those tar those costs are not subject to that benefit maximum. So a really great um, enhancement that we've made to our plans for the share. And the majority or, or several of our um, web plans provide preventive coverage at 100% today. So plans, um, the exclusive PPO plans and plan six cover preventive services at 100%. So members don't pay anything for those costs, especially now that we've added the Preventive First program. However, plans one and five can still have member costs for preventive services. So plans one and five, which um, have quite a few members in them, they have um, an incentive level benefit on preventive services. So that means for the first year of members in a plan, preventive services will be covered at 70%. If the member goes in for a preventive appointment during that plan year, then the next year their benefit goes up to 80%. And it'll go up that way until it reaches 100%. And then at that point, then preventive services are covered at 100%. But up, until they get up there, you know, they're still paying out of pocket for prevention. So um, Delta Dental is proposing to cover preventive services at 100% for children on all of our dental plans. So that would mean for plans one and five, for members under the age of 18, we would cover preventive services in full. And we believe that this is one more step forward towards removing barriers to children being able to access um, the important preventive services. Any questions? That, that's our, our dental um, change. Any questions on that? Obviously, we'll be hearing the uh, cost implications of that over time. Yep, that'll be presented with the next round. Okay. Yes. Okay. I like Great. it. Perfect. Yeah, I do too. Um, one more step in helping increase preventive utilization for members and really removing barriers to being able to access prevention. Yeah. And I just want to say um, thank you, everybody, for allowing us to talk today. Um, we're really excited about the program changes that we've been working on um, and really looking forward to um, another renewal. So thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we are going to stop now and uh, I have it at 11.17, and I'd like to start again at 11.25. So I'm proposing a, <clears throat> a, a eight-minute get up, walk around, bio break, whatever, and we'll restart at 11.25, okay? 
I'm all right. Sounds good. I put that in the chat, Tom. So good. see you Thank in a few you. minutes. You bet. Okay. Bye. Rose, I have a question for you.
Are you there yet, Rose? I am here. Uh, do we have uh, any public comment? No. Okay. Um, I'll try to remember to ask that at the final bit uh, when at the end of the uh, agenda. Oh, I don't think we'll have any. We rarely have public comment for CM. I know. We've had it. Um, I think the only time we've had it have, has been around the benefit request. But yeah, maybe that went to the full board. I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. They usually want to comment at the full board, not at the yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I my uh, computer tells me it's 1125. So I am uh, calling us back into session. Um, and what we have is, um, uh, and as Rose has on your screens, the 2324 VSP proposed plan design changes. Um, so away we go. Good morning, everybody. And uh, oh, well, yes, it's still morning. Good morning. <laughs> so uh, I'd love, I'm Valerie Swires. I'm the market director that works with you directly on OEB. And uh, I'd like to say Happy New Year to everybody. And I hope that 2023 is a, is a great year. So I'm going to take a few minutes and we're going to look at the current plan design offering. Going to talk a little bit about utilization. Um, that's been running very well. And then going to look at some of the proposed plan changes. Um, looking at two, uh, matching the retail frame allowance of $150 and $300 at Walmart as well as adding retinal screening covered with a $10 copay. And then we can go over any questions or follow up. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, OEB has been with VSP since 2017. And while we look at the renewal annually, um, we did set a four-year rate guarantee that is in place through October of 2025. But that doesn't mean that we don't look at how the plan is running and what are some changes that can be made on an annual basis. Next slide, please. So currently there are two plans that are being offered. Um, it's two out of six of the total all overall vision benefits that are available to OM members. You have the choice plan and you have the choice plus plan. Both of them are on an annual benefit frequency of 12, 12, 12. And that's for exam lenses and frames. Um, currently, it's on a service year. So if you get your exam, say in January, then you're next eligible next January. Or if you were to get your frames in February, then you're next eligible in February. So 12 months um, from when you last received your services. One of the changes that I am going to propose, um, very slight, and that is that we refresh benefits as of the um, count or the plan year, which would be October. Um, there would be no impact to make this change. I believe that you have several other benefits that refresh um, at that benefit plan year versus on the service year. Um, and that would be something that would be very valuable for those members who, who maybe, you know, don't remember and every, you know, 12 months from when they last received services and it be I'll offer a lot more flexibility for their for their plan offering. Copays, both plans have a $10 copay for the exam and a $20 copay for the materials. The key differences are in the frame allowance. 
The Choice Plan is 150 and the Choice Plus Plan is $300. Um, so pretty big difference between those offerings. And the same with contact lenses, 150 for the Choice Plan and $300 for the Choice Plus Plan. And then when you look at lens options, lens enhancements, again, here are some um, differences between the two plans. Standard progressives are covered for both. Scratch resistant coating is covered for both. Protection and polycarbonate lenses for children. Um, the PLUS plan has polycarbonate lenses for adults. Um, this is a higher resistance to shattering and breaking. It's also a lighter lens and so very popular something that we put in place many years ago for children because we didn't want adults not selecting um, polycarbonate lenses for their kids because they were going to have to pay a little bit more for it so that's something that all of our plans cover and it comes out of you know our general fund and then premium and custom progressives with a 15 dollars copay are covered in full as well as anti-glare coating um, is also covered in full with a $15 copay for the PLUS plan. Essential medical eye care is provided for both, and this provides additional services for diabetics, as well as people with macular degeneration um, and um, glaucoma, and then also for conditions such as pink eye or, you know, an injury to the eye, but this is um, secondary. Medical coverage is primary for medically related eye conditions. The contact lens exam is covered in full with a, a not to exceed $60 copay. Um, you, they also, for both the Choice Plan and the Choice Plus Plan, get an extra 50 to spend on featured frame brands. So this gives them additional um, monies towards frames such as Nike, Calvin Klein, Columbia, just to name a few. We have quite a few that are on this list. And then light care. So light care allows uh, members who don't need a prescription to use their frame allowance towards ready-made non-prescription sunglasses or blue light blocking glasses. This is instead of prescription glasses or contacts. And then vision therapy. This was something that we added just a, um, a couple of years ago. It's fully covered evaluation um, up to 75% of the approved therapy sessions, not to exceed $750 annually. So I'll go ahead and have you go to the, the next slide. So in some of the enrollment, um, when we were implemented back in 2017, we were added to your already existing offering of vision plan, of vision benefits. Um, and over the years, you can see here, we're having a nice increase in enrollment. And so in 2020, we had a 18% increase in enrollment over 2019. In 2021, we had a 4% increase. And in 2022, 12%. And most currently, um, as of this October, we had an 8% increase. So we have a little over um, 14,800 enrolled in the plan. Total overall, I believe, enrollment in your vision benefits is close to 50,000. So you can see, you know, we keep growing, we keep increasing enrollment, and we believe that that will continue to happen, especially as we continue to make improvements to the benefit offering, as well as that our costs are very well controlled. Next slide, please. At those historical plan trends. So that average claim cost, very, very stable. You can see here, um, 2019 to 20, we saw a slight increase and then staying pretty stable in 2021. And then a little bit um, of a decrease 
but again, very, very stable in 2022. And this is because we are cost control and negotiating discounts um, less than usual retail and customary with our provider network. Next slide, please. So when we look at kind of like that rate of utilization or that paid frequency, um, we looked at this year over year, 2019 through 2022 plan year. And you can see we had this dip in 2020 when a lot of our practices closed, just like everybody else. But historically, we don't see a lot of fluctuation in that paid frequency. We're not quite yet back to the paid frequency of 2019. So right now, or for 2022, our paid frequency was 117 claims per month per thousand members. And in 2019, it was 127 claims per month per thousand members. So we believe there is some room here for our paid frequency to go back to what it was historically. Um, so these are things that we take into consideration before we make any large changes at renewals or rates, because we know that we could see some huge increases in enrollment. We could also see some large increases in in utilization as far as the number of claims if everybody you know starts going back and really going and utilizing the plan as they had prior to to COVID and we do expect that next slide please I want to apologize for a typo here. Right here it says 2021. These numbers are actually for 2022. I have 2021 over here on the um, on the right and then 19 as well as 18. So as I mentioned, one of the things that I am going to be proposing, and it is a change that we made to PEB's plan designs, for 1 1 2023, and that was to match the frame allowance um, of 150 and 300 at Walmart. Currently, they are at $80 and 165. And one of the reasons, and the, the impact to this is very, very low. It's only 1%. So, very small, and it will increase the perceived financial equity for members that predominantly choose to obtain services at a lower cost retail provider. And since Walmart is often in rural areas, this is considered to be, you know, in areas where maybe it's a healthcare desert, it increases equitability by geographic location as well. And you can see currently and in years past, these two allowances are covering a large percentage of the frames that are being selected. Um, the 150, this equates to $57 on the wholesale, which is how we reimburse, including um, some dis <clears throat> dispensing fees. And for the wholesale on the 300, it's $115. We know that at Walmart, predominantly the percentages of frames that are available are in the lower cost range. That 150 retail is gonna cover about 97% of the frames that Walmart offers. And so that's really going to expand uh, the coverage. But again, the impact is very low 1% because the majority of frames that are going to be available are not within that 150 um, or even that 300. It's just that it's a perceived equitability from a financial perspective. And then on the $300, uh, 
frame allowance. You can see here 88% of frames that were selected in the last in the plan year 2022, 88% were covered in full. So the average out of pocket was only $9. This is across, you know, all of the claims. So very, very low out of pocket costs. It's also one of the reasons why this is the um, the front the plan that is most selected by members looking at the two plans between the choice and the choice plus plan. Next slide, please. Might be a little bit early, but I did include slides that kind of outlined kind of the impacts to the, the changes that I was recommending. So for the choice plan, um, your fully insured rates, uh, for tier, um, looking at increasing that match to 150 for the Walmart frame allowance, 1% or 2 cents, very low per employee per month. And then I'm also going to be suggesting the adding retinal screening with a $10 copay. This does have a little bit more of an impact. It's a flat cost that's going to be going to be added and I don't want you to be scared by that 7.3 percent that's only equating to a dollar 57 um, so very low and as well as I am going to be um, extending a discount to your current rates so we will not have to be concerned about that cap of 3.4 percent increase all right, next slide, please. And then the Choice Plus plan. Um, again, only that 1% to add the, to match the $300 um, frame allowance at Walmart, and then adding the retinal screening with a $10 copay, a 3.9% impact or $1.90. And again, going to be extending a overall rate decrease. So do not need to worry about that 3.4% cap. Next slide. Thank you. I'm going to go into a little bit about that retinal screening. So when you think about a well vision exam, there are four components that are included. There's that patient health history. So that's that conversation that you're having with your provider. You have some preliminary testing. Um, looking at things for um, your visual acuity, different things like that, refraction, and then ocular health assessment. And looks like we went over to the next side, so that's just perfect. And that retinal screening is really a, is a piece, it's a component that, um, that I'm recommending that is in addition to what is currently offered in the plan design. So while dilation of the eyes is still recommended as standard of care um, for viewing the retinal nerve as well as the blood vessels of the eye, many people are very sensitive to dilation and recovery times can be several hours. As a result, it makes it harder for some people to schedule an appointment limiting them to only times when they don't need to return to work or have anything else to do or possibly just on weekends. So members maybe may even choose to put off dilation one or maybe even more years. And this reduces the chances of detecting conditions that impact your health, um, such as diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, hypertension, high cholesterol, and as well um, as these conditions could impact your sight. So retinal tears or retinal detachment, um, if they're not caught early. So while we cost control the retinal screening with a not to exceed $39 copay, this may still limit um, access to some members with lower percentages of household incomes, or maybe they have multiple children. And so 
paying that additional $39 could, could impact their ability to, to receive those services. I'm sorry, I did not miss that your hand, I missed that your hand was up. Please um, go ahead, ask, ask your question. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm not hearing you. Yeah, I was on mute. Um, so my question is actually towards our two health plans because I'm under the impression that retinal screening is covered under our medical plans. Is that true or not? Jeff, this is Sapari with um, Kaiser Permanente. Um, yes, I believe that is the case, but I, I, I would like just to confirm. It's possible the, the complexity here, uh, retinal screening, when there is a reason for it, I'm sure is covered. So yeah. if you have diabetes, uh, I'm sure you uh, retinal screening is covered. The issue, and I think what's being offered here is that a um, this would be a general screening for the population who don't have a specific indication they're coming in for an eye exam and uh, and they are being given this retinal screening even though they don't have um, indications or concerns of glaucoma or macular degeneration or diabetes or a retinal tear. So if, that is correct. That's okay. So what so the medical medical covers whenever it's indicated, what we're going to need to do in the interim is figure out whether, you know, what people have, what they recommend for retinal screening, because I'm sure it's been studied. There's no question for disease conditions that it has been shown to be an appropriate treatment for the general population. I do not know whether or not retinal screening there's evidence to support its its use. Yeah. Um, Tom, this is Erica just confirming that it on the mode of plans it's covered um, for uh, diabetes, diabetics. Yeah, well, and it's, and it's also going to be covered if someone has a history of macular degeneration or you know retinal injury and things like. I'm sure it's covered for all of those things. So I think we should be considering it, but I think we need to um, make sure we've defined the entire picture here right. amongst our providers. I agree. So we'll we'll ask our two medical carriers to clarify when retinal screening is covered, and we will do um, a review to see whether or not uh, what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says about retinal screening in the general population. There's another question that's coming from, um, it says DOCTRCI uh, Birch Creek Teams Conference Room 27. You're on. Good morning. It's Greg Clouser from the PEP board. <laughs> Hi, Greg. I'm at, I'm at work, so when I'm at work, <laughs> I love it. This room, it's a little easier for me than trying to find another computer. I so, love it. Okay, um, great. I, I would like to I would like to shed a little light um, from the PEP board as to why we did this. And uh -huh. um, one of the reasons is yes, um, specifically myself for the last eight or nine years, I have had this retinal screening done as just a normal person. I pay my $40 every time I go in to get it done. Um, two years ago, um, they caught a health issue that we looked into and um, it was caught earlier than it ever would have been. And so for me, I was able to then see my regular doctor, take a look at it and um, I no longer have that. So I didn't use my medical plan. Uh, I used my medical plan, but I didn't have to use additional dollars in my medical plan for something that was caught early. Um, and so as you said, yes, there are many things that can be caught. Um, we looked at this as a uh, as something that we are hoping for the minimal amount of cost to the plan that those types of things will hopefully be caught in our people to prevent um, heavier costs down the road, if I may. Um, and I've you know I've paid my forty dollars every year. I'm excited now that I get to pay 
$10 instead of the 40 um, and still get that same benefit. So from us, that's kind of one of the reasons we did. Um, we're, we're hoping and um, as well going to get some information on, you know, this coming year, how that looks. But um, yeah, as a general person in on the insurance plan, um, this has not been covered um, only if you have certain uh, diabetes. Right, you have to have the medical, yep. yeah, you have to have yep. the indication. You have to have the indication exactly. for, so, the, for, the, for the test to be little, covered. Just a little extra there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Very, very helpful um, to hear how Peb added it and the rationale behind it. And um, the um, our process through CIAO, um, is that if we're going to add particularly a I think this would fall into a prevention category. It's a screening. And so the uh, what's interesting is that um, if if the US Preventive Services Task Force had a had made it an A or a B, it would already be on the list of a required benefit at no cost. So we're going to need to do, um, it will be important for us to uh, spend, to answer the question of where, whether or not there's evidence to support its use in the general population. Uh, and we'll be able to get that answer before we go on and um, where the full board will be looking at adding uh, to, adding benefits so uh, i really appreciate right and uh, as a that, as a preventative what we were looking at is that 40 dollars plus the 10 dollars sometimes may because it's it's always asked uh when i go to get my eyes and you sure. want this or not and so it's something that that extra 40 dollars uh, sure. i know that we chatted about it may stop individuals from getting this screening which then may help save us dollars in the long run and so a $10 copay we felt was a little easier for our members to pay to maybe help find yeah. those into those those items down the road. Yeah, I get that. And I, Greg, I think it's um, um, the, the my my only if, if it actually has if the intervention, if the screening test has been shown to be of of value from a population-based standpoint, it would be it should be covered at no cost. You know, just like mammograms and and uh, colorectal cancer screening and things like that. So, uh, our process is to make sure that is to look at the evidence around whether or not it is pro proven the intervention is proven to make a difference from a population standpoint as compared to um, uh, not looking at, at at the at the again if we if this made a difference it should be not even at a 10 10 dollar copay if it's a prevention services that has been viewed as being one cost efficient and making and identifying disease and and uh, <clears throat> Reducing health burdens should be covered at zero copay, it, it, just like all the other prevention services that we that we have our providers um, pay for. So we'll we'll do some additional research in this, and we'll get it done by uh, by the February board meeting, so we're able to to give a um, a report based on on um, uh, the science behind retinal screening. So, Tom, I don't know if it would help you, but I, I'd like to just reiterate. So, um, the, the Board of Ophthalmology, the ADA Board of Ophthalmology, they, they highly promote retinal screening. However, it is not a replacement for dilation of the eyes. They, they feel that it is a great way to potentially diagnose and detect conditions early 
Yeah. Because a lot of people are not getting their eyes dilated because yeah. of the, you know, sensitivity I, to dilation. I so that's number one. I know. I understand what you're saying, and uh, and the uh, I, I'm just trying to tell you how CL yes. is structured and how it works, and the um, and um, a, 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 a an academy, you know, the American, you know, the ophthalmologists have mm -hmm. a, a lot of um, a lot of entities have what they view as very important and they aren't always backed by we're just going to do a simple we're going to spend a, a, a month we'll look and see whether or not the people who look at the science of population-based care recommend this or not that's a simple um it's a simple statement and um i again i'm i'm not trying to be I'm just trying to hold see out to the process that we follow, which is built into our name. We look at the evidence and outcomes of um, of recommended services. So that's that's what we that's what we're here about. And um, I appreciate um, you know what you're saying. I also appreciate what Greg says. But again, we are tasked specifically to to look for evidence around whether these uh whether or not interventions make a difference so robert you're on I completely yeah thanks uh, just to back that up a little bit tom i went in uh, for an eye exam uh about three weeks ago and uh, the retinal exam was uh was pitched as a full alternative to the dilation and as sure. a consumer I just said, sure, why not? Mainly because I could afford the 40 bucks without the sure. irritation. Yeah. So what I'd like to see is what is the efficacy of the retinal uh, scan as compared to the dilation before we make that decision on whether to lower the, the, the cost point, because yeah. then more people will do it just what I did. And if it's not as good, of, if it's not a true replacement, then that's something we need to consider. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we will, we will, this is a very important, uh, I appreciate you raising this. The um, CIAO will um, essentially table this part of the recommendation for us to be able to explore the, uh, I mean, we will not give a recommendation to the board on this additional recommendation until we've you know, been able to look at it and we'll discuss it in February. So Valerie, if you can be available, either uh, Glenn or, or Margaret will outreach to you and we will go ahead and, uh, and, and um, work with our consultants and our, uh, and the uh, OEB and PEB staff and come up with uh, a further discussion on this. Sounds good. Okay, great. Any, uh, I see that um, you're at your the last screen. So um, if I'm, you have any closing comments. Uh, no, I think, um, I think I'm finished. Um, if there were any other questions before we adjourn. Anything else from anybody? Uh, Rose, do we have any public comment? No, we have no public comment. OK, well, thank you. So um, thank you very much again, Valerie, and for both uh, for the Kaiser Permanente and the MODA staff for your presentations today. Um, the uh, will be uh, it, it the. Particularly the, some of the MODA plans are recommendations we heard in a way the first reading and there's more data uh, information about costs and things like that that will be put together and and we'll look at that um, again the recommendation around the um, from VSP in terms of their vision coverage the uh, issue around expanding the benefit for Walmart was pretty straightforward and the one issue that we need just to explore 
to a greater degree is what we just talked about, which was the um, retinal screening outside of a medical indication. So uh, we'll get to that and bring that back to the next um, month's meeting. Any additional comments or questions from CL members or our PEB partners? Margaret, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I do not. I uh, okay. I've been taking notes, so we Super. we Thank know you. we know where to head from here. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, close the uh, January CL meeting. Thank you all, folks. Thank bye you. bye. Thanks. Happy New Year. Bye.